Hello and Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. I hope you all are at home and having a wonderful start of your new year. Thank you so much for joining us today for our program, Golden Record Messages from Earth. My name is Alicia, and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City. I'll be your host today for the program. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering this content, please do click on the link in the description. So feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And of course, if you've got any questions, you can put them there as well. Now, every year when we are about to count down to a new year, you know, January 1st, very exciting, we will often take a look back at the year that we just had. So we'll remember the good times, we'll remember the bad times, and we'll maybe begin to plan ahead for the future. Now, oftentimes, you or your loved ones might also make something called a resolution. So this is a time, you know, we're refreshing our calendars, we're looking back on the past year that we just had, and we're setting some goals for where we'd like to go next. So I'm curious, did any of you happen to make any New Year's resolutions this year? Let me know in the chat if you did. But today, everyone, we are going to be talking about something that also paused and reflected back on Earth and humanity as a whole. So it was something that wanted to almost take a picture of life here on Earth so that we could preserve it, we could memorialize it, and send it off into space so that others could also learn about our lives here as well. Now, often we do that every day using things like art, right? We do that in music, in our songs, we remember things, or in paintings, we might try to, you know, paint a picture of something that we saw that was beautiful, or in theater, we tell a story. So today, everyone, we are going to be talking about some of this art and music in space. Now, I know you might be thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. You know, I thought space was a microgravity environment. There's no air. And if there's no air, that means that sound waves can't travel, right? Which means, well, there can't be any sound. So how on earth can there be music in space if in space no one can hear you scream, right? <laughs> okay, fair enough. So I will get to the music part in just a second. But you might also be wondering, hold on a second, wait. You're from the Intrepid Museum. Aren't you guys a big ship with airplanes? So why are we even talking about space in the first place? Well, that's a good question. So everyone, let's do a quick recap for those of you who may not be familiar. This is the Intrepid Museum. So we are located in a historic World War II era aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. It was constructed in 1943 and it served in three wars, World War II, the Cold War and the Vietnam War. And then in 1982, they converted it into what it is now, the museum that we all know and love, the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. And we are docked right off the shoreline of Manhattan on the Hudson River. But wait, there it is again, right? You might have heard that word, space. Why are we a sea, air, and space museum? Well, we are, of course, a sea museum because we are a naval ship. In fact, here is a propeller that you can see on the right here from our ship. Uh, one of the four, actually, that were on the Intrepid that pushed it through the water. So it's really big, as you can see. And as you can see in this picture here, too, it is moving right through that water. Everyone, we are also an air museum because we carried, launched, and landed, and also currently have on display a number of airplanes and helicopters. So, you know, we like to say we were kind of like a floating airport. This is the Avenger, by the way, that big blue one on the left there. This is the oldest airplane we have on display. It's from World War II. And then, of course, we've got the Fury there on the bottom right. That was a jet plane that was used later during the Cold War. But why are we also a space museum? All right, well, take a look at this. So everyone, do you happen to know what this thing is? Take a close look. Tell me in the chat if you do. What is this thing? You see, during the Cold War, we were in a race. We were in something called a space race with the Soviet Union, which is about modern day Russia. And of course, every race has a finish line, right? Now, ours in this race was to be the first country to safely land a man all the way on the moon and then return him back home again. But, of course, you know, there were some number of smaller steps that we still had to take before taking that first giant leap on the moon. So, everyone, this right here, this big thing you are looking at here, is one of those smaller steps, all right? This is part of it, and it also has to do with why we are a space museum. This very special vehicle here is called a space capsule. And they are what we really used our earliest missions for to get into space. So 
really before we went to the moon too, all these baby steps. Before we did that, we had to first figure out how to launch. We had to figure out how to, once we're in space, even breathe up there, how to do things like eat and sleep and work over long periods of time. And then of course, you want to get to the moon, you need to learn how to dock with other spacecraft, how to land on the moon. And then all of, you know, all of these things before we could just go bouncing around and, you know, hitting golf balls on the moon as they did. So capsules, just like this one, were part of some of those very early steps. And of course, once they went up, they had to come back down. So these capsules, everyone, actually landed in the ocean. They figured that the water would be a nice, kind of somewhat softer landing surface than you know, in the middle of a desert or on a mountain or something. So they would then, you know, have these capsules out there floating in the middle of the ocean. Then people would still have to come retrieve the astronauts. They'd pick them up in something like a helicopter you'd see here. And they would also retrieve and pick up their space capsule and eventually, you know, put it in a museum or something. And so everyone, on two very special occasions, the Intrepid actually got to be the prime recovery vessel, that very important ship that got to go and pick them up. So... You know, thinking about that, how do you think they felt to be part of such an important thing like going into space, right? Amazing. I think that'd be incredible to be part of that journey. And so actually, here are some pictures from that retrieval. As you can see on the, uh, the left there, you can see the sailors all lined up along the sides there of the Intrepid. They're so excited. They're looking on. I absolutely would be pretty excited as well. Actually, let me make that bigger for you. Uh, how cool is that? You know, we actually do also have some postcards and things in our collections from uh, those occasions where, you know, everyone's very excited. They're writing home to their loved ones saying, whoa, guess what just happened today? This is so cool. Special stamps on them and everything. Uh, so everyone, that is why we are a space museum. All right. The Intrepid played a very important role in picking up astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space. Now, believe it or not, for about 100 years, Earth has actually been sending a lot more things, though, out into space than just capsules and astronauts. But it is not necessarily what you might think. So we've been sending out our radio and television signals, so things like sounds and pictures and voices, even music, out into space for decades as far back as the early 1900s. And really, every TV show or every song that you've heard on the radio, it's all out there, believe it or not, just waiting to be picked up by someone. And it's invisible, but it is there to be received. And currently, those signals are about 110 light years away from Earth. Now, what does that mean? All right, light years, this weird concept. So light years are actually how we measure distance in space. It's the distance that light can travel in one Earth year. Now, to get even more specific, everyone, let's talk about the sun. So it takes the light of the sun about eight Earth minutes to reach us here on Earth because of where we happen to be located to it uh, in the solar system. So the light that we see outside right now, it's a little overcast today, but I see some sunlight out there. The light we see outside is actually from eight minutes ago. Now, that actually means that if the sun were to burn out right now, right this very second, we actually wouldn't even know that it happened for eight whole minutes. Mind blowing, right? But for comparison, it actually takes five and a half hours for the light of the sun to get all the way out to Pluto. So eight minutes, sorry, right, we're, we're pretty close. So if we are eight light minutes from the sun, how far away is one light year, right? There's that word again, light year, those two words, right? So let's take a look, right? At one light year away, well, it's way outside of our solar system, first of all. It's about six trillion miles away. Pretty far. And from that distance, our sun would actually just look like a dot. It's kind of just like another star in the universe that you can see here. So one light year is much further than the moon, much further than uh, the edge of our solar system even, and even much further than any human or any man-made object or machine has ever even traveled in space too. And then you think, okay, our broadcasts have actually gone a hundred times past that. So let's think about that. What does a hundred yeah, light years away happen to look like? Let's look. All right. So kind of the same, right? A hundred light years away, you are way, 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 way out there in space. You probably actually wouldn't even see our sun because it would be so far away, but you would still see plenty of other stars. And, you know, technically those stars are 
possibly suns for other places too. Now, I know it is really hard to imagine just how far these broadcasts have actually traveled, but I might be able to illustrate it in the perspective of our own galaxy. So everyone, take a look at this. I want you to imagine you on Earth are there in that blue dot, okay? You are on Earth. Earth is inside of that bubble there, that little light blue bubble, that dot. That is 200 light years in diameter, okay? So it's very wide, but you are at the very center of that blue dot. And our broadcasts have traveled out 100 light years on either side of us, okay? So that bubble is the radius there. That is the whole range of how far our um, signals have traveled outside of Earth. So keep your eye on that blue dot, all right, until you can't see it anymore. So let's go on an adventure. You are here. That is 200 light years in diameter. Keep your eye on that dot. Here we go. All right, so we're going out a little bit further. You can still see that dot. That arrow is absolutely going to help you as we go. Going a little further. All right. And remember, we are zooming out into the uh, Milky Way galaxy, our home. A little further now. Can you still see that blue dot? I want to expand your screen a little bit maybe, but I, I can still kind of see it there. It's getting small. Even smaller now. It is there, believe it or not, in all of those other stars and things. There's that arrow to help you, though. Even smaller. Look at that. Now we're actually seeing all of the, uh, the bands of our Milky Way galaxy. And there you go. There is the full uh, beauty, the whole glory there of our Milky Way galaxy. And you are there. But that gives you some perspective, right? Very, very small. So yeah, I don't know if that doesn't make you feel small. I don't know what will. But we are there in that Milky Way galaxy. You can barely still see that dot. And so while 100 light years away does actually seem super, super far from here on Earth where we are, and don't get me wrong, it absolutely is. It's still only a very tiny fraction of our galaxy and even of the universe. That one itty bitty little pixel within our own galaxy, let alone everything else that's beyond that, that we've only really even just started to explore. So everyone, let me ask you a question here. Everyone, my question to you is, uh, you know, what if there is life out there? What if these TV shows and these songs that we happen to be sending out actually do make contact with distant civilizations? Theoretically, you know, any intelligent life within that little bubble or eventually beyond it could tune in, listen to our programming for better or worse. But the signals, you know, they do thin out a little bit the further they go. So we don't know how clear that transmission would be. And again, you know, you think about some of the things that we do transmit today. You know, do we really want some alien life form's first impression of us to be a reality show or, you know, even a cartoon with talking cars for that matter, right? Does that really represent who we are here on Earth? Is that real? I don't know. Maybe you have a talking car. But if we were trying to contact distant life, all right, and if you really wanted to have your message heard clearly, you're probably going to need to write it down or record it even and send it out maybe a bit more intentionally out into the stars. And so in a roundabout way, that is kind of what led us finally now to the Voyager Golden Record, which is a super cool thing that I am going to talk to you about today. Now, what is Voyager? Well, in case you were not already familiar, Voyager, as you can see on the screen here, uh, in 1977, NASA sent two spacecrafts, two probes called the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes out into the universe to explore the distant galaxy. So these were each a piece of machinery, you know, there were antennas and electronics that were launched in order to help us gain a better understanding of our solar system. The timing of the launches, though, were very, very specific. They happen to line up, look at this, with a very special once-in-a-lifetime alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that only occurred every 176 years. Now, that would allow us to gather some really close-range data and images from our distant planets. We'd be flying really close by it, specifically, though, Jupiter and Saturn to start before then reaching interstellar space. So the layout of the four planets that you can actually see here, it meant that they'd be able to use less fuel and it would take less time because they'd be putting the spacecraft on this very special path. You can see it kind of curves out like a kind of like a like a seashell or something. Uh, they'd be putting it on this path that it would swing them from one planet to the next on its own. 
if you've ever, you know, been on a swing, you know, you feel that motion kind of pushing you. And that's what happens with the gravitational pull. Now, you know, what does all that mean? Well, because of that gravitational pull of each planet, the probes were able to get something called a gravity assist. Uh, basically, a flyby of each planet was going to bend the spacecraft's path and increase its speed just enough to keep it moving along its pathway there. So the primary missions were to explore, again, Jupiter and Saturn, specifically things like, you know, studying active volcanoes on uh, Jupiter's moon Io, um, also taking a closer look, of course, at Saturn's beautiful rings. Well, the two spacecraft were built to just last five years. That would be long enough for them to make it just past Saturn at its furthest point, And then that was going to be the end of it. So that happened. They actually did explore things. Voyager taught us about Jupiter's red spot that you may know is actually a raging cyclone, right? And there's lots of lightning. It's a big storm. Um, it showed us close-up views of its moon Europa also that we now know suggests it might be covered in an icy crust over perhaps liquid water. So maybe, you know, considering maybe there might be some sort of life there. Very exciting for us to explore further. Uh, and we also saw, yeah, these active volcanoes on another one of uh, Jupiter's moon Io. And then as it flew by beautiful Saturn there, we discovered actually three more moons of Saturn. We also saw a thick um, Earth-like atmosphere around one of its moons, Titan. Also something we are looking closer at for possible signs of life out there. And we learned more, of course, about its beautiful rings. But as the years went on, they were actually able to successfully achieve all of these objectives, looking at Jupiter and Saturn, and the spacecraft stayed alive. It kept going. So the scientists got really excited, and they were like, okay, let's expand this project even further. Let's see how long we can go. So they used remote control programming. They were able to alter the mission slightly. They also included Uranus and Neptune for Voyager 2. So... Almost 10 years after its launch and five years after passing Saturn, Voyager 2 also gave us a close-up view of Uranus and 11 of its moons. We also discovered that it, too, happens to have a ring. It's smaller, but it does have a ring around it. And uh, we were also able to tell that the temperatures are as low as negative um, 353 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very cold out there. Uh, three years after that, it flew by Neptune. We discovered six new moons of Neptune. Neptune. We saw rings around that as well. And also a huge rotating dark blue spot on it, that big rotating storm that we now call the Great Dark Spot of Neptune. Now, shortly after Voyager 2 passed Neptune, though, scientists decided it was going. they were going to turn off the cameras um, because they wouldn't really be flying close enough to any other big bodies like that to take images. They wanted to instead observe other things that they could perceive with the spacecraft. So a few months later, happened to be Valentine's Day of 1990, they did the same thing for Voyager 1. It happened to be about 4 billion miles away from the sun. Uh, and of course, it's still moving. But not before first turning it around to take its last series of images, which was a 60-frame mosaic that has now been very sweetly dubbed the Solar System Family Portrait. So take a look at this. This is just wonderful. And I'm going to take myself off the screen so you can see it. There you go. So this, everyone, is the only series of images that captures Venus, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all arrayed around the sun. And this is also the portrait of Earth that you can see down below there that inspired Carl Sagan to think about really the fragility and the uniqueness of our home planet. He, it was a tiny speck in a beam of scattered sunlight, a pale blue dot. Really amazing, isn't that? So honestly, you know, besides the incredible pictures, what's really amazing is that both of these spacecraft's lifetimes have now actually stretched on from a lifespan and expectancy of just five years to now over 40 years. Isn't that just amazing? And between Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, we now have explored all of our outer planets of the solar system, 48 of their moons, and all of the unique rings and magnetic fields and all of those really cool planets. So we have resolved a number of questions that we started out with. We've raised a ton of other interesting new ones about the origins and evolutions of our solar system. Uh, and actually, as of 2018, both Voyagers have now entered interstellar space that is outside of our solar system beyond the heliosphere, which is that protective bubble of particles and magnetic fields that is um, created by the sun. And 
they're still going. <laughs> they're flying at about 35,000 miles an hour in different directions, actually. So billions of miles from Earth, and they are still sending back data. And they're going to keep doing that until they run out of power which is just incredible. So we're learning so much now. Uh, of course, the James Webb telescope just got launched. Amazing. And that's going to tell us a lot more too about the furthest reaches uh, of our, our galaxy and beyond, my goodness. But um, these little probes, the Voyagers 1 and 2, have also just been sending back incredible data for us as well. So everyone, before we move on, uh, I want to just see if we have any questions. And uh, you know, let's just see what we got here as we um, start to start up our program and start before we get to the golden record. So let's see. How long did it take the Voyagers to get to Jupiter and Saturn? So it took them about two years to get to Jupiter. Um, so again, they launched in 1977. And so that was 1979. It got there. Uh, and then about three years to get to Saturn. Um, so a little bit longer. That was about 80, 81. Um, and the visits to Jupiter were actually about four months apart and then about nine months apart for Saturn. It had to do, again, with the trajectory and, and how fast they were moving. Um, but Voyager 2 then kept going. So it ultimately was about nine years before it got to Uranus and then um, 12 years before it got to Neptune. So that's really, really far away. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Uh, are the Voyager spacecraft the first to leave the solar system? So no, actually, believe it or not, the Voyager spacecraft are actually the third and fourth human spacecraft or human made spacecraft, I should say, uh, to fly beyond all of our planets in our solar system. So about five years before the Voyager launches, um, there was something called Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 that went up. Pioneer 10 also did flybys of those four outer planets, and then it left the solar system in 1983. Uh, but Pioneer 11 was also meant to you know, look at Jupiter and Saturn, and then it went uh, interstellar in 1990. But because of its speed, now Voyager 1 has actually passed Pioneer 10 uh, to become the most distant human-made object in space. So yeah, we did send up two prior to that, and uh, also kind of an interesting, you know, record uh, golden thing on that one too. But we're going to talk about the Voyager ones today. So everyone, um, as we covered, you know, the Voyager missions, I, I did keep kind of referring to this thing now, this golden record. That's the name of our program today, right? What is this golden record thing? Well, scientists knew that they happened to be planning, you know, to spend, send these spacecraft out on a one-way trip. And they realized, all right, if it's never coming back, why don't we also attach a note from Earth? You know, think of it like a message in a bottle. They threw it out into the cosmic ocean, just waiting to be picked up. And who knows, maybe even responded to someday by some distant civilization. So there was this message, all right, this time capsule, as you might refer to it, really, they recorded this on a 12 inch golden record that you can see on screen here. Now, before I go on, I do know some of you out there might not know what a record is. Ah, so let me explain, not to worry. Before we had things like Spotify or, you know, Prime Music or MP3s even, we had these compact discs or CDs. So these were round pieces of shiny plastic. They held an album of music, usually about an hour of music or, you know, how long the albums usually were on them. Uh, and, you know, they also made, you know, pretty good Frisbees or coasters even. So that's the compact disc. Before we had those or CDs, right, we had these cassette tapes. All right. Now these actually were a little different. They had magnetized ribbon on them that wound from spool to spool. You can see those two little holes there. And uh, that magnetized ribbon is what the music would play off of. Uh, and yeah, the, the tape inside that magnetized ribbon is very thin, very fragile. And many of us have, you know, maybe not so fond memories of trying to wind them back up ourselves with the end of a pencil after your tape player decided to chew on it. Uh, but before we had cassette tapes, then we also had these eight tracks. Now, before this, you know, th these eight tracks admittedly were a little um, before my time, but I am told they were similar to cassette tapes, only shorter. You can see kind of the magnetic ribbon along the bottom there. Um, they were shorter in that they held about eight tracks of music. So about eight songs. And then everyone before eight tracks, we had records. Now, records are actually still around today. Uh, oftentimes when um, an artist will release a new album, 
Uh, you know, they might they might have it on a CD, maybe. I guess mostly now it's MP3s. But sometimes, kind of as a novelty thing, they might also release it on a record. Uh, people who really love music actually say that records are the just the best audio quality even, even better than MP3. So sometimes they want to have that vinyl record, you know, in their collection just to own it like that. Um, but I can also say you are equally as likely to see one of their players, a record player in a museum these days, um, also referred to as the phonograph or the gramophone. Now, the earliest phonograph was made in 1877 by this guy here. He's a very young looking Thomas Edison. Maybe you've heard of him before. Uh, that early player there actually used wax cylinders, though, instead of discs. So you can imagine kind of like a tin can but made out of wax, and it actually had the music carved into it, around it, and it spun around that way. Uh, but, you know, it later blew up uh, with a very similar invention called the gramophone, as you can see here, which used these flat discs with the music etched into the top of the vinyl record. Now, on both, the music was played uh, using a stylus or a needle, which you can kind of see on the right there. The needle would actually move over the very fine grooves on the record, and it would vibrate using very specific acoustic frequencies, and then it would come out of that big bell shape on top to amplify it, to make it louder. Now, this was... I mean, first of all, it sounds very complicated, I know, but this was by and large actually the main format of sound recordings for many decades after that. And it's actually the medium then that they chose to use in 1977 to record our message from Earth. Now, they actually mounted these records and a record player, believe it or not, on the side of the two Voyager spacecraft. And right now, those very records are about 13 billion miles from home. And in just about five or 10 years, so about uh, 2030, actually, both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are going to be so far out into the universe that they won't even be able to communicate back with us anymore. But they're still going to keep moving out there. Remember, their cameras are off, so we're not going to be able to necessarily see what they see anymore. But they're just going to keep sailing out further and further into space forever or, you know, until they crash into something that gets in their way, or maybe until somebody happens to, you know, catch it and try to figure it out. Now, again, though, we have absolutely no idea if there is any life out there in the universe, but considering how we think that life sprung up here, it is safe to assume that we probably are not alone in the cosmos. Uh, you know, it is a very, very large place, as you saw earlier. But that said, it's also safe to say that whoever is out there probably does not look or sound, or think, or read the way that we do. So even if distant life forms did find this spacecraft and did find this record, how would they even know what it is, or what it represented, or how to use it even? And, you know, I bet a bunch of you out there probably don't even know how to use a record yourself, and that is A-OK. -okay. But let me ask you this, everyone. How do you write a message for someone that is intended for people that you don't know, and who are in the distant future. You know, what if they can't um, even see or hear or feel or, or taste or smell the way that we do, or even at all? What language would you even write that message in, right? You know, you would, of course, you know, want to be as clear and concise and easy as possible to understand, but you also have very limited amount of space or words or pictures to do it in, too. So NASA had to invent a brand new system of communication, a code really, that in theory could be deciphered by anyone anywhere in the universe to teach someone how to actually play <laughs> this record really if they found it, which is no small feat on its own. And then they did that. They put the instructions of how to do it on this kind of album cover, so to speak. And here it is. This is the uh, album cover, really, of the Voyager Golden Record. But don't forget, everyone, here on Earth, we have systems that we developed. We've got Earth units of measurements for everything from length and distance and time. Everything, including RPM, revolutions per minute, which is how you play a record, by the way, is something that was entirely devised by a human. So they decided to start off this new language with a building block of the universe, hydrogen. 
one proton and one electron. And the thought was that any spacefaring civilization would probably understand the properties of hydrogen, the most commonly known element in the universe, enough to know, maybe, what this diagram meant. All right, so this image here on the bottom, the bottom right corner of the album cover there, it illustrates the transition of the spin movements of the two lowest states of hydrogen. So the proton and the electron, if you remember your chemistry. So that is what those uh, circles are showing us there. Okay, inside of those blue circles, you see that movement. You can kind of see the spin rotation there. There's a line with a dot on the bottom on the left and a line with the dot on the top on the right. That's the spin movement. <laughs> Hopefully they're following us that far. Now, when this happens, everyone, electromagnetic radiation is released uh, from that for a period of about 0.7 nanoseconds. And that is illustrated there in the center. So it's hoped, oh, we are really hoping here, first off, that aliens would equate that tick mark in the middle with this transition time unit of measurement. And then from there, they could figure out the rest of the diagrams on the cover. So if I've lost you already, just you're along for the ride. If you're following me, great. Here we go. We're still going. <laughs> now, the image on uh, the to the left of that, okay, so on the bottom left there, is meant to show where we live. So we are right in the middle of that beautiful starburst. It has actually been specifically designed with distance in mind. The direction of the proportional length of those lines happen to show where other distant collapsed stars are. And they give off uh, pulses of radiation. So um, pulsars, that's the type of star that they are. And the period of the, uh, the radiation there, the period of the pulse, is denoted next to each line in those little tick marks again. So theoretically, if aliens are able to make that connection back to the original one with hydrogen, maybe they could possibly match the periods of time with the correct pulsars in real life. And then look at that picture know what that means, and triangulate our position, and come say hello. Simple, right? That's easy. I can do that in my sleep. <laughs> now, how does all of this relate to sounds and music, you might wonder, right? Well, remember, this is a record, and there is actually a record player included on the craft uh, with the needle already in place, ready to go. So these pictures here on the top left of the album cover, so right above that pulsar picture, show the proper elevation and the proper placement of the stylus on the record and the markings around it define again time and speed so it's the speed at which uh, you have to have that rotating in order to hear and play the record correctly now translated again based on the unit of measurement that i described earlier with the hydrogen the top image shows about 3.6 seconds per rotation so that's about 16 and two-thirds rpm so it's at this speed you'd be able to begin to hear what's being played on the record there what's recorded and then on the bottom image we can also translate that the entire playing time of the record is 3229 seconds or about 54 minutes. So again, about an hour of music, which is pretty standard on a record or a CD at the time, right? So let's imagine everyone, we are some distant civilization. Okay, let's imagine we have eyes that even can perceive and see this thing. Uh, let's imagine we are advanced enough to understand what hydrogen is, how it works, and we're able to somehow put all these little, you know, puzzle pieces together to figure this thing out. What would we hear? I know that's what you're all dying to know. Well, what would you put on a record that's meant to represent the whole of the human species at this moment in time? What message would you want to send out into the universe? The thing is, everyone, creating this record was an opportunity for humankind to reflect on itself and for us to really think about ourselves as one unified species. Scientists knew that it was very, very possible that the record might never be played it's a billion year journey out there forever. Maybe I mean, never get played ever. No one could ever pick it up. But creating it together reminded everyone of who we are and where we come from. And it's really crazy to think that someday, billions of years from now, that record might actually be the only remaining evidence of humanity at all. So the first message that we wanted to send was about peace and working together with the goal of improving the quality of life for everyone here on planet Earth. So the very first sound on the golden record, I will actually play it for you now. It's the voice of the United States Secretary General, Kurt Waldheim, and he says the following. 
Let's try that one more time. As the Secretary General of the United Nations, an organization of 147 member states who represent almost all of the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. We step out of our solar system into the universe seeking only peace and friendship to teach if we are called upon to be taught if we are fortunate. We know full well that our planet and all its inhabitants are but a small part of this immense universe that surrounds us, and it is with humility and hope that we take this step. So, you know, really special there to have that 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 uh, message of peace, you know, going forward. Um, but of course, English isn't the only language that's spoken here on Earth. So they also included greetings in 55 different languages. I wanted to just cover the whole gamut there. They began with Akkadian, which was spoken in Mesopotamia about 6,000 years ago. And then they ended with Wu, which is a modern Chinese dialect. And they felt that it was really important that Voyager greet the universe as a representative of one Earth community, albeit, you know, a complex one of many, many different parts. And the story behind the creation of actually this part of the interstellar message, as you might call it, was later described by Carl Sagan, who um, was in charge of the project. You heard that name before, that guy that coined the phrase, the pale blue dot. He said that due to the limited amount of time that they had, many of the speakers on this record happened to be from Cornell University, where he was, as well as some of the surrounding communities. And the speakers actually weren't given any instructions on what to say, other than it was just to be a greeting to possible extraterrestrials, and then it had to be brief. You know, <laughs> very open-ended there. So curious, you know, tell me in the chat, what would you say? What would you say to somebody? Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and play now here just a random sampling of what some of the other people decided on. So here we go. Adanish Lu Shulmu. Taikong Beng Yu. Nin Ho. Nin Jia Babe. Wu Yang the Lion Jia Jail. Tahiyatuna Lil Astika Fin Nujum. Ya Laita Yajmaun as the man. Nomushkat. Bishe Shanti Hook. Hart Likahuta on Idering. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Bonjour tout le monde. Shalom. Tantia Guri Saluti. Konnichiwa. So hopefully you were able to hear some of those. Um, but remember now, everyone, the sounds of Earth are also more than just what we say to each other, right? So humans are uniquely alive on planet Earth. We have no idea if civilization out there even knows what things also like oceans or birds or thunders or, or whales sound like, right? So we really take for granted the sounds of things like crickets or laughter and heartbeats. But it's very likely, too, that alien life has never before even heard those sounds. So we actually put some of those sounds on there, too. So here is a few more. See how many you can recognize. And, you know, hey, tell me in the chat, what other sounds would you want to add on there that you think represent life on Earth? Here we go. So maybe you recognized a few of those sounds yourself. And then, of course, everyone, because it is a record, music, too. So the scientists provided music samples from around the world, all different cultures, Eastern and Western classics, from a variety of eras as well. So they had things like Beethoven and Bach and Mozart, but then also things like Aborigine songs from Australia and pan pipes and drums from Peru, uh, bagpipes from Azerbaijan. There's a Navajo chant and even some good old rock and roll Johnny Be Good. 
So here are some snippets from that really special intergalactic playlist. eclectic mixtape we could say uh and of course i know you might have been listening for it i didn't play johnny be good because of course of rights issues but there was actually an episode of saturday night live in 1978 you know very fresh to when this got launched when steve martin played a psychic and he says the extraterrestrials have found the record and after all of this time they've finally sent us a message back send more chuck berry chuck berry of course being the writer of the song johnny be good they just wanted more music out there now, on the other side of the record, there are actually pictures. There's 115 of them. But remember, this isn't a digital disc. There were no JPEGs or anything back then. It's actually pictures encoded in audio, believe it or not. So the pictures are in the audio waveforms themselves. And this is where it does get a little bit more complicated. And we are really relying on them having some sort, of course, visual perception to figure it out and even see these pictures in the first place. Because if they can't perceive the visual stuff, I mean, the, that's what pictures are, right? So the last few symbols uh, on the record here are actually here on the top right of this album cover again. Um, and they explain how to render the images so that you can actually see them. So the top right symbol here shows how the waveform data is broken up. Each section takes 0 0.008 seconds to play. Again, underneath it, you can see that unit of time measurement again with those little dots and dashes there. So that is 0 .0, uh, 0 0.008 seconds. So again, let's hope they get that far. Now, the symbol below it shows that each of those sections of data completes one out of a total of 512 scan lines that make up a completed image. Now, to understand what that means with those scan lines, you kind of have to understand how an old cathode ray TV worked. This is like archaic 70s technology now, but you can kind of think of it maybe like blinds um, in, in a window. So if you have uh, vertical or even horizontal blinds, how um, or even kind of like a woven blanket, maybe where each strip gets put together to make kind of a larger picture. So kind of like a mosaic in a way, but with lines. Uh, and then within each of those strips, if you were to code the decibel levels, all right, so that's how loud it is to show whether it be lighter or darker, depending on if it was louder or softer then you'd actually be able to draw out the image. And it is actually pretty mind blowing. Um, there are some videos that you can find online of people actually taking this process and running it through their own you know, computer generated system. And it, it works, it works. And I'll show you some of these pictures in just a bit. Uh, but the first image that would appear then, if you get all of this right, is this thing here. It's this calibration circle. Now that's the last image that we see on the album's cover. It's underneath it all. So if they could somehow figure out all of those things, and if they were able to decode a shape that looks kind of like that picture, that circle there, pretty simple picture there, they'll know that they were right. They'll know that they were onto something and they can keep going. And then if they do, if all goes according to plan, here are some of the other 115 images that they would see. So again, there is that calibration circle, a very, very simple image. But again, if they can see that, they match it on the record album and they go, oh, OK, yeah, I think we're doing this right. Let's keep going. Now, again, here is the location of Earth based on the pulsars. So again, another image that we see on the cover that we talked about earlier. So again, they see that. They can say, see it on the, the album cover. It's again, it's confirmation. Okay, we're doing the right thing. We're on the right track. But now 
that pulsar picture happens to be positioned next to an image of Andromeda. So that is our closest neighboring galaxy. So again, another helpful tip for them to perhaps come find us based on some visual clues there too. Uh, also on the right there, you see some mathematical definitions that is based on that hydrogen language once again. Again, math is a uh, human derived, you know, the way that we do math and all of our, you know, numbers and symbols and things, these are things that humans have come up with. But by uh, balancing it against that hydrogen language there, again, that's a way to kind of compare and contrast and show some similar things there. Also some physical units as well. Then you've got other things. You've got pictures of planets in our solar system. So again, Earth and then Jupiter. Jupiter is a big one that they might be able to come by and see. Again, that big red spot. You've also got things like DNA bases that they show. You have images of cell division, which is very basic to us in our life on Earth. You've also got human anatomy and conception pictures. You've got the growth cycle of a human there. Humans, again, something very foreign perhaps to uh, somebody way out in the universe that looks very different than us. Uh, images of human relationships as well. And then you've got things like geographic information about the Earth got continental drift patterns um, shown here actually as past and um, present. Present where the hand is. You see that image in the center there with the hand next to it. Um, that's what it is today. Before, up above it is what it looked like a long time ago. And then in the future, what it's predicted to look like uh, underneath it there too. You've got images then. That's a drawing. But now you have images too of land masses and geography like shorelines and sand dunes and architecture and terrain, man-made buildings like that on the right. Uh, images of vegetation and insects and fish and animals. Then images of people too. So people doing things. Uh, on the left here you see pictures of runners, so athletes. You've also got pictures of scientists learning and exploring and researching. Uh, pictures of astronauts exploring out into space and pictures of children learning too. But I always uh, like to point out, I think this picture on the right, it's sweet with all the children looking at a globe. But I also always think this might be a little confusing to them because why are these children so big compared to the Earth if they don't understand the concept of a globe and they think that's actually our planet? They might think humans are these monstrous creatures that are cowering above our planet. <laughs> that one always makes me laugh. You've also got pictures though of people eating, uh, as you can see here on the left, and drinking. These are comical pictures maybe to you, but again, maybe this isn't how they eat. Maybe they don't eat at all, right? People um, cooking, uh, people building things like you can see on the right, building structures and machines and walls here even. Simple, you know, thatched roof houses there, simple things too. And then, of course, complicated things like technology, uh, technology like the X-ray there. So that's a cool picture because it shows that we have the technology to look inside of our bodies even and have a picture of it right next to the hand. They can compare the two there, the image and the actual person's hand to show there's a way somehow you can shine light through it or something. Uh, and then, of course, you know, travel and, and uh, our rockets and these amazing um, vehicles that we have to explore space, you name it. So all sorts of pictures like that. But everyone, they also consciously chose not to include images of things like war or poverty or disease or, you know, they didn't want to have anything negative like that or also any specific re religions or ideologies or, you know, anything that was very, very focused on any one particular region or group of people to really hammer home that we are all one global human community. So everyone, that is the Voyager golden record in a nutshell. Um, there's clearly a lot for them to figure out on that cover. You know, you can see here still it, it baffles me every time I look at it. Um, it might be a little presumptive because, yeah, if they can't even see or hear the way that we do, none of this is really going to matter anyway. And you also have to think. What if distant life forms are, you know, you saw that picture with the children, right? What if they are so big that this is actually just like a grain of sand to them, right? They don't even notice it. Maybe it just, you know, it's like a piece of dust floating around for them and they just like don't even think anything of it. Um, or alternatively, what if they're really small and, you know, they think it's this huge looming, you know, asteroid coming to hit them or it's some enemy coming to get them and they just, you know, blow it up or they try to, I don't know, maybe they, they, they like gold and they try to eat it or something like that. So what if, you know, I mean, you could, your head could go many places here. What if the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs was actually another Earth sending us their version of the Voyager Golden Record? 
you know, dinosaurs probably don't know how to use a stylus on a record too. So that might not have gone anywhere anyway, but you know, the thought experiments are endless here. It's kind of fun. But again, that really wasn't the point of the project. Remember, one of the other messages now everyone on the record was a message from the president at the time. Uh, the president at the time, his name was J uh, Jimmy Carter. And in his statement, he said this, and I'll make it real big for you to read. This is a present from a small, distant world. We are attempting to sur survive our time so we may live into yours. We hope someday, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. This record represents our hope, our determination, and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. And that is what it's all about. Now, I know I just threw a ton at you, everyone, but before we move on into a quick activity, I do want to pause again and see if we've got any other questions. So let's go. Let's see. Oh, what is the record made out of? Right. So um, the record itself is actually made out of gold plated copper. All right. It is not solid gold. It's gold plated copper. Um, it's 12 inches in diameter. Um, the record's cover. So again, the thing on uh, the, the left there that's covered in all those symbols, um, it's actually coated um, in aluminum. All right. So that, that is aluminum. That's going to last a little bit more. It's going to be a little stronger. It's got a sample of uranium 238 on it as well. So the idea is that some distant civilization that encounters this record might be able to use the ratio of the remaining uranium, say that 10 times fast, your remaining uranium, uh, to the other elements though there in order to determine the age of the record. That's a way that we are able to do that here on earth with this like dating thing. Um, the record. So also actually, this is a fun thing. They have an inscription around it. You can kind of, let me make it real big here. You can kind of see it right around, if you can see my, you can't see an arrow there. Um, if you look right around where it says the sounds of earth on the one on the right, that kind of black ring before you get to the rest of the record, you can kind of see like a little bit of like a scratch mark on it, right? So that actually is an inscription. The records had the inscription to the makers of music, all worlds, all times. It was hand etched on its surface there between the label and the playable surface, which is a cool little touch. But actually, it uh, was a little controversial. Um, the record originally got rejected because that wasn't supposed to happen. That wasn't in the original plans. Um, but apparently Carl Sagan again, who was in charge of the project, later uh, convinced them to keep it as it is because that's actually something that people used to do in the 70s. They'd, you know, write their names on it or, or little notes like that uh, in between it. So it kind of just was a human personalized touch, which is kind of neat. All right, any other uh, questions? Oh, how they pick what was on the record. Great. So the contents of the record, um, again, they were selected by NASA, um, by this committee that was chaired by Carl Sagan. Again, he worked at Cornell. Um, and it took about a year, actually, to pick everything, to gather it all. A lot of thought went into this. All the pictures, all the sounds and the musical selections, some of those I played for you. Uh, and actually, the inclusion of Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good was a little controversial at the time. Um, some people who were part of the project thought that rock music was a little too adolescent, you know, it was a little too teen that it didn't really represent, you know, adults. But Carl Sagan supposedly said back, well, yeah, there's a lot of adolescents on the planet. There's a lot of teenagers on the planet. Why not include them too? So, uh, so it got added. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, he actually also did want to include the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun, on the record as well, a classic, uh, and did ask the Beatles. They actually did really like the idea, but unfortunately, they didn't own the copyright to their own song. And the company that did wanted to charge $50,000, dollars still a lot of money, um, per record for the two records to do that. Remember, it was Voyager 1 and 2. Um, and meanwhile, you know, they didn't have a lot of money to do this. The entire project cost, you know, $18,000 to produce. And they wanted $50,000 for each record. So clearly, unfortunately, due to a little bit of greed there, it never made it on. And the aliens will never know who... Uh, the Beatles are, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, let's see, any other questions here? One last one. Uh, when will the Voyager probes run out of power? Right. So um, again, it is even when they do run out of power. So they're they're thinking that they're going to run out of power in um, actually the next few years. So about 2025. Um, but even if it does run out of power and can't keep sending us signals back, 
Um, which, first of all, let's just bravo to the Voyagers because they were only supposed to last five years in the first place. So a, li a big long life there. Um, but eventually when they do um, run out of power, they are still going to keep going out into space. So who knows how far they will ultimately ever get. And, you know, maybe many, many years in the future when we can travel through, you know, many light years in the blink of an eye and no problem, maybe we'll be able to like track it and, you know, have a big like, you know, mitt and be like let's go and like catch it in like a net and get it anyway or we'll let it keep going who knows <laughs> thought experiments guys this is great all right now my friends uh to wrap us up here the voyager record was in a sense a kind of time capsule i alluded to this earlier uh with you know we we start the fresh the, the new year fresh we think back we reflect and we kind of you know, think about what was 2021 to us or what was 2020 to us. You know, we, we are able to kind of have this like time capsule in our minds or even physically too of um, what a year was or what anything is really. What is humanity? That's what this was all about. So what is a time capsule, right? So remember earlier we talked about space capsules, the spaceships that Intrepid picked up, uh, basically a container for an astronaut or two that gets launched into space. Well, a time capsule is similar in that it is also a container, but for the past. So in the case of the Voyager Golden Record, it was a log. It was an actual recording. So a time capsule could be something like a diary or a scrapbook, or it could also be an actual container that you can put objects in so that you can look back and remember them later, or maybe even, again, pass them on to people in the future. So this one you're looking at here uh, was actually one that was put together by a scientist at a lab at MIT. This was from 1957, and they set an open date for it a thousand years in the future. You can see there it says 2957 AD. Please do not open until then. So can you imagine what the world will look like in 2957? I'll leave that open-ended. Now, you can make your own time capsule at home to be revealed later as well. Uh, it has been 44, 45 years, you know, now growing uh, since Voyager left Earth. And it still has yet to be found by anyone out there that we know of. Um, and how far in the future, you know, will it go? We don't know. So you can think, how far in the future do you want your time capsule to be found? You might set an open date for... I mean, you could say a thousand years it might be a long time, but you can wait as long as you want to to open yours. Um, you could say five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Who knows? It's really up to you. But I kind of think the longer, the better, because if you're going to open it, it's really going to be special. You're going to forget what's in there. So, you know, it's cool. You can open it up and see how much you've grown and changed over that time. So you can create your own time capsule at home by just writing about even your experiences. You can photograph things or put in photos that mean something to you. Uh, you can create a scrapbook of what you know you and your family are doing right now and all of your experiences at home right now at this very historic time as well. Uh, or you could just also collect items that are meaningful to you um, or even just things that, you know, that represent who you are today. So this could be things like uh, photos or um, drawings or you know, small items or keepsakes. Just see what you can find that describes you and what story you want to tell about you or your family or whatever story you want to tell it is uh, about today. And you might also include things uh, from today. So things like newspaper clippings or current events um, that you know are written about. Um, maybe even with something cool like a length of string to see how tall you might be right now. Also, maybe a list of things like your favorite color right now or your favorite food or book or song or movie right now. And you could also write a letter to your future self. So think about, do you have any uh, hopes or goals for the future? Again, this is a nice kind of time to think about that sort of thing with the new year and the new resolutions. Uh, also, do you have any questions about the future? Who knows what things will be like in, you know, five, 10 years. Maybe, though, you could also make some predictions about where you'll be when you open it years and years from now. Will you be living in the same place? Might you be Might you be living on another planet? Who knows? How long in the future are you setting yours, right? So many people, when they put this together, this box, um, they will often use uh, something like a shoebox or a jar. 
Also, some people like to uh, bury it, you know, in uh, the ground for maybe even future generations to dig up. But if you do do that, be sure that you put it in a very watertight container. Of course, you don't want it to fall apart underground if it's made out of cardboard or something. And you probably also want to avoid things like food or batteries because you will be storing it long term. Don't forget. So those can go bad or attract some not so uh, nice critters there, too. But otherwise, storing it somewhere like the back of your closet or in an attic or in a basement also might be a really good idea, too. So be sure to, you know, write on it, set a date to open it and write down, of course, when it was sealed up too. Don't forget to say it was today or whenever you do it. And then the hardest part, no peeking. So it is really just best to even forget about it. Just put it somewhere, the dark recesses of your, you know, under your bed or your closet or your basement or whatever, and just forget that you did it because it'll just be so much sweeter that fateful day when you actually do reopen it and see what you were like back then. So be creative, have fun with it. There is no right or wrong way. Whatever you come up with will be a very unique treasure that you are absolutely sure to enjoy. So my friends, that concludes our program, Golden Record Messages from Earth. If you do make a time capsule at home, though, be sure to take a picture, tag us on social media. We would love to know what you put in yours. It's always fun to see what people think kind of represents them and everything. Uh, I would like to thank you all again, though, so much for watching and sharing your questions and comments with us today. If you've got any other questions about our programs, you can always reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. Um, do be sure, though, to follow or subscribe to this channel for our upcoming programs. And if you enjoyed this or any of our past programs, we'd also love your feedback. There is a link uh, in the description that I encourage you to click on to answer just a few questions that will help us to plan for future sessions. Uh, now, our next program, everyone, is going to be next week, Thursday at 3 p.m. It's going to be High Flying Design, where we're going to explore the parts of a plane. We're going to talk about how nature kind of influences its shape and its design. And we'll also be talking about the four forces of flight how we even get things to stay up in the air and also create a very, very cool paper airplane together at the end. So once again, that is coming up next week on Thursday at 3 p.m. Also a reminder, our museum is back open to the public seven days a week from 10 to 5 p.m. So if you happen to be in the area, come on by and say hello. We would love to see you on site. All right, so once again, everyone, thanks so much for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you online for another upcoming Intrepid Adventure. See you next time, everyone.